Welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on cybersecurity and the digital development agenda. Um, I hope everybody is good, although it's kind of a blue Monday here in, in uh, Oslo, even though it's uh, Tuesday. We had some uh, strict uh, restrictions on us uh, uh, yesterday because of the COVID-19 situation here. Uh, but uh, the technology seemed to work. We have some had some issues, but we will see if we can get it to uh, to work uh, successfully here as well and during the, the the webinar. So this webinar is uh, is organized by NUPIS uh, Research Center for Digital Technology and and Cybersecurity. Uh, at this research center, we we do research on on digital technology and international relations. And uh, more specifically, we focus on uh, national autonomy, cybersecurity, uh, cloud services, uh, global tech companies, and and also um, today's topics, uh, uh, cybersecurity capacity building. So, um, with this seminar, we we thought we wanted to to take stock of um, let's call it a trend. On uh, we we're focusing on a trend on the connections between cybersecurity and uh, the digital development agenda. Uh, this is increasing in, in international politics, um, uh, but it is also an increasing um, trend that goes on between research and policymakers, I, I think. So, um, this, uh, this focus and this trend and this uh, capacity building and digital technology is part of a sem seminar series that we have had on NUPI. Um, and, and today uh, we have been very, very fortunate, I think, so to have really exceptionally good and globally recognized experts with us. Uh, Melissa Hathaway and, and Francesca Spidalieri. So, um, Melissa Haraway is, uh, is currently, currently leading the Haraway Global Strategies and has served in two US presidential administrations, leading the Com Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative for, George, for President George Bush and the Cyberspace Policy Review for President Barack Obama. She also published uh, regularly on, on cybersecurity matters. And uh, Francesca Spidalieri also works at uh, the Hathaway Global Strategies, and uh, she is an adjunct uh, professor for cyber policy at the University of Maryland's School of uh, Public Policy. And she has a long, long experience uh, working for several international organizations, such as the World Bank, the ITU, the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise um, on, uh, and, and, and um, others um, focusing on this topic. And Francesca has uh, also uh, published several articles uh, and publications and frequently also gives lectures on cyber related events. Uh, and this fall, um, Melissa and Francesca have been working together to identify pathways to bridge the development community to the cybersecurity capacity building agenda. And uh, this work has just recently been published in a report. And this report was commissioned by the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise and the World Bank's D Digital Development Partnership. And today we are going to hear more about their findings and recommendations. Uh, but before, before we really start, I would like also like to encourage everybody who are watching that uh, during and after uh, Melissa and Francesca's talk, talk talks, it is possible to ask questions to the panelists. And then please just uh, use the Teams chat and, uh, and we will try to address these questions after uh, the talks in the Q&A session. So um, um, with that said, uh, without further ado then, um, uh, Melissa and Francesca, uh, the floor is yours. I will try to, to share your presentation now, so I will uh, give you just a couple of seconds. And Absolutely. I will... and, uh, 
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be uh, around the world. I'm actually in California, so it's early morning here. It's only uh, 5 a.m., uh, so I can't, I couldn't ask for a better way to start my day, Niels. Thank you. Um, and just to go along with what you just said, we wanted to thank again the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, who really envisioned, initiated, and commissioned this report, um, and the World Bank and Digital Development Partnership for funding it um, and connecting us with so many expert multilateral development banks, international organization, research institute, as I was saying earlier offline to Niels, um, his report and his studies uh, not only on the digital dividends um, uh, and the, the, the positive aspect that te technology can bring um, to support sustainable development around the world, his studies have really uh, shed light on the vulnerabilities and the issues of leapfrogging into technologies when we don't have yet a mature legal framework, um, cyber hygiene and other protection that can ultimately make a lot of those countries countries more vulnerable. Um, so uh, Neil, so if you go to that first slide, it just really um, showcases some of the key goals of the report. The report was launched um, in November during the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise annual meeting. Um, as Neil said, the reports highlight some of the key challenges and benefits at the same time of incorporating cybersecurity, digital resilience, and cyber capacity building into the broader development agenda. And throughout the interview process, we try to um, uncover some of the reason why both cybersecurity and digital resilience are still not yet seen as strategic cross-cutting issues across the broader development agenda. We also try to highlight some best practices and some bridging venues to co better connect the cyber capacity building community with the development communities so that we can start to try to speak the same language and not just bring new technology to advance uh, supposedly um, some of these developing countries without better understanding the, the inner threats that we might be bringing uh, with it. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, the objectives of this report were really uh, broad. Um, and as we conducted all these interviews, again, with multilateral development bank, international organization, international and national development agencies, um, we uncovered more issues that um, were not clear to us at the beginning, but also um, some public goods, some universal uh, tools that can be adapted and used broadly um, to better assess um, where we stand on a cybersecurity maturity curve uh, to better identify gaps, uh, to better um, uh, highlight best practices where there has been, um, you know, more of this bridging, more of this ability to bring cybersecurity, digital resilience, cyber capacity building into development projects. Um, and the results are all in the reports together with some of our main recommendations. And I encourage you all to go download the report to read it and give us feedback because we continue uh, to have uh, these discussions with many of the organizations we interviewed originally for the report. Next slide, please. So the um, United Nations estimates that the, the the entire developed world it's funding more than 160 billion dollars for infrastructure, digital infrastructure. And, but it, this is just a small percentage of what is actually needed if we want to um, close the gap between uh, the developed world and the developing world and where we want to be um, to have better infrastructure on the world. Um, and while that gap still needs to be filled, um, it will never be able to cl close unless we also create better cooperation, better coordination among the many uh, donors and that, that we have interviewed and many others, they often do not um, coordinate their activities. We found a lot of overlaps, duplication of efforts, which uh, obviously often leads to um, waste of precious resources. And so again, uh, closing that um, infrastructure gap, it's, it's key um, if we want to reach the sustainable development goals by 2030 or later. <laughs> um, can you go next to the next slide, please? 
um, as I was saying, the uh, um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals um, uh, have a very strong digital component. Every single one of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals has a digital component. And while some might have a stronger digital component than others, there is certainly a general recognition that digital technology can help advance and accelerate the realization of Sustainable Development Goals. It can be one of the most important tool to allow billions of people to achieve uh, sustainable development, economic growth, social development. But again, uh, we need to also think about the in unintended consequences of what uh, Secretary General Guterres uh, calls the, the digital, um, the, 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 the dark side of innovation, the consequences of uh, fast adoption of technology on society, whether we're talking about increased surveillance, um, disinformation campaign, cybercrime, uh, um, and a whole host of cyber threats that our increased dependence on technology um, and digital tools is creating in our society. And so only by addressing those issues, embedding in, them in our programs, developing the risking mechanism, uh, we can start to address some of the unintended consequences of, again, this dark side of innovation. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so this is like a famous quote by the Secretary General, as I was saying, um, is that we are not necessarily considering this dark side of innovation. And this whole host of cyber threats, um, you know, we already hear a kind of, uh, discussion about post possible cyber warfare, but, you know, we talk about violation of privacy, uh, about protection of our data, um, can really undermine the ability to achieve the sustainable development goals and to really take advantage of the technology for sustainable um, uh, development and economic growth. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the report, again, um, attempts to highlight many of, the, of these issues, especially when we talk about the development community and how they are not yet considering cybersecurity and digital development a um, really in integral component of every development project. But he also tries to identify pathways and venues to bridge and bring together the development community with the cybersecurity capacity building community. So I'll like, I'll, I will highlight some of the key findings and recommendations from the report and then again really welcome your questions, um, comments. Hopefully we'll get Melissa on the line uh, so she can expand more on some of these key findings. So next slide please. The power of both. So a big chunk of the report, which again, I really encourage you um, to go and read, is really the history of how the digital develop and mostly the development community came together, how it developed since the end of World War II, really with the goal of, um, you know, uh, uh, helping the rest of the developing world when there was not even a definition. Um, becoming more developed, uh, achieve better economic growth, sustainable um, development, uh, building hardcore infrastructure, and it has a whole history of how these development communities expanded and divided in, the, in different sub-communities dedicated to different parts of the world or different objectives. Um, some organizations in the developing community and the development community are dedicated to either specific regions of the world or specific objectives, or they're dedicated to you know, countries that are transitioning to the democratic government. And so it goes through the history of the development community and how they went from funding, again, hardcore infrastructure, bridges, roads, ports, to incorporating more and more digital technologies into their project. However, most often than not, without building in those de-risking mechanism to make sure that the technology using those projects doesn't cause other issues or ultimately make some of those countries more vulnerable to cyber threats. Then there is another piece of the report that talks about the development of the cyber capacity building community. And here's where we see a variety of communities of practices 
they emerge from different disciplines. Obviously, at the beginning, it was the computer uh, science, the computer crime, law enforcement, tech, more technical community of experts. And the, the eventually cyber capacity building community has expanded to include everyone from human rights activists that are concerned about, again, the unintended consequences of some of these digital technologies um, to a whole host of dedicated people that are strengthening our ability to respond to incidents, share information, uh, building capacity, technical and operational capacity in different countries. But again, more often than not, we see um, still not enough coordination and cooperation between all these different communities of practices. They continue to pursue their own aims um, and missions based on their culture and uh, the mandate that they were given. And so what we're trying to uh, really um, recommend through this report is that we need both. We need the power of both community working together, better coordinating some of their efforts and starting with speaking the same language, which sometimes it's uh, is one of the problems that I will highlight. Next slide, please. So among the many benefits of bringing these communities together, um, it's also the need to educate our national leader and decision makers um, in understanding again that the threats that emanate from uh, the potential misuse of information communication technologies and other emerging technologies can really become tools of cyber crime, surveillance, disinformation, digital authoritarianism, data exploitation, espionage. Again, that's what Secretary Guterres um, intended when he was talking about the dark side of innovation. And having a better understanding of these unintended consequences of potential misuse can better guide the development community and our national leaders in supporting other countries and organizations in adopting digital technologies um, in, in, in a more um, you know, consistent way, careful way, trying to maximize the use as enablers of sustainable and secure development. We're not trying to scare anybody from adopting technology. We just want to consider where some of those unintended consequences and embed the security into the project from the beginning, from the design of a project, not as an afterthought. And integrating cybersecurity insight and activities into those development programs, we believe would lead to achieving better, more resilient outcome, streamlining processes, focusing funding to what is actually needed by the, the recipient countries and eliminating the duplication of efforts that we often see among all of these different projects. And one interesting funding, in fact, and I know, Niels, you write about this in your um, studies as well, is that what we realize is that there is almost uh, two different sets of uh, developing countries that receive help that we identified as um, the darlings of the developed community, those that receive help from multiple different venues and organization. Um, and sometimes that's where you see the overlaps and duplication of effort and the orphans of the developed community, those that rarely receive any help whatsoever, whether it's development um, funding or or cyber capacity building um, help. And so again, by having a better coordination mechanism, better cooperation among these different organizations, we awfully um, will also highlight some of those orphans that also need um, to receive help. And again, uh, awfully by achieving better, more resilient outcome ultimately. Next slide, please. So one of the key um, point that I think we need to really um, uh, highlight to national leader, decision maker, um, development organization is that infrastructure, any kind of infrastructure today is a digital infrastructure as a digital component. There is no such a thing as a brick and mortar uh, bridge industry um, road that does not include a digital component. And because they all include digital component. Again, we need to build those de-risking mechanism um, since the get-go. And we need to make sure the leaders across society and in all of these development organizations understand that because of this heavy and increasing digital component in all of the infrastructure project, we need to embed risk management from the design of a project throughout the entire life cycle of a development project. Next slide, please. 
one of the um, key uh, interesting findings um, from talking to so many um, different countries and organizations is that we really need to update our playbook. And when we say we, I, I'm talking about more the cyber capacity building community that continues this um, uh, su su supply driven approach of providing capacity building where they have a set menu of option or a playbook and they often go to developing countries and say, well, here, what you can choose from. We can help you build your national cybersecurity strategy. We can help you build your CERT, your computer and emergency response team, and update your legislation. And while we're not saying that you shouldn't do all those things, what we often do is that instead of listening to what is really needed, to what the needs are of those developing countries and in countries that are trying to harness the right technology people and tools to develop and to achieve the sustainable development goals is just continue to perpetrate this model where we have again a menu of option or set of a, a predefined tools and mechanism that we want to export and with that we tend to export our own people our own knowledge our own um, capacity rather than developing indigenous capacity and understanding what is really needed on the ground and update that playbook. So maybe it's not this uh, strict list of options that they get to choose from, but it's devising innovative, creative ways to help countries achieve their own goals and address their own security and economic needs. Um, and only by connecting cybersecurity and digital resilience to the economic aspiration of a country. Again, most countries have also developed digital strategy. They're focusing on how cyberspace can enable their economy. But when we are not connecting the secure cybersecurity needs to their economic aspiration, these two often tend to be developed separately and again leads to um, many of the unintended consequences that Niels discussed in uh, some of his great studies. Um, next slide, please. So we, when we talk about this de-risking mechanism, we're talking both about addressing it on, on the side of the development project programs when they are being developed. We need to actually program funding for the continuity and sustainability of those projects into the country's national budget. So when an organization goes in, helps develop a um, you know competent authority for cybersecurity or a computer emergency response team or other actual entities that require people, tools and strategy. If they don't start thinking about how to fund those institution or program after the development fund is over, those programs cannot be sustainable because there is literally no money to continue to support them. And on the other side, you also often put the, the developing country in a worse position because they might not even be able to repay their low interest loan while they're also trying to support the sustainability of their organization. So one of the de-risking mechanism is starting to program funds into the project from the beginning and then making sure that the national leaders understand that they also need to uh, put fundings into their national budget to continue to support those projects. And the other again key uh, takeaways from the report is that we need to implement digital capacity building in a more needs driven, demands driven way um, that is tailored to the individual and national circumstances and needs of that country. Next slide, please. So here's some of the um, issues or problems that we see in achieving these all overarching goals. As we have heard throughout our interviews, um, both the demand as well as the supply of cybersecurity and digital capacity building is definitely growing, no doubt about it. Um, it's, cybersecurity is becoming a growing priority. So I'm in no way saying that they're not paying attention to cybersecurity. Um, even the countries that are um, developing really fast are starting to seek assistance both um, for their economic and development and security needs. But one of the most striking findings as we conducted all these interviews with more than 40 multilateral development bank, national and international development agencies and other international organizations was that there is no common definition of what capacity building entails. Who should be doing it? Um, what should be part of that uh, capacity building? Again, some organizations define it as building institution, 
competent authority, computer emergency response teams, other organizations intend capacity building as reforming the legal system so that they can better address cybercrime. Others um, talk about developing technical and operational capacity. Other organizations are like strictly about training program, but very few organizations or donors, uh, countries or foundation see capacity building as the whole picture, which should involve institutional, governance, legal, technical, and operational capacity development. In fact, it, Many of the organizations we interviewed use this term capacity building um, in every discussion, but when they actually when you actually look at their programs, they lay out all these different and sometimes overlapping cyber capacity building themes or topics or pillars, dimensions, just activities that they consider part of their bucket of capacity. We develop a table in the report just to show that there is a um, little overlap and consistency among all these pillars, themes, and topics uh, often. And because we don't have a common definition of what capacity building is and how it should be developed, unfortunately, we often end up talking past each other. Next slide, Niels, please. Another of the key findings is that cybersecurity and digital resilience, as I was saying earlier, has not seen yet, at least as a strategic cross-cutting issue in a necessary component of digital development. Um, and again, while the development community has certainly embraced digital technologies, digital means as a way to accelerate the, the achievement of the sustainable development goals, promote inclusion, achieve all these other objectives, the development community still does not see cybersecurity as a development issue. And, and here the problem it could be, you know, starting with a narrative problem. Cybersecurity in the majority of um, communities outside the, you know, just cybersecurity experts uh, is still associated with national security, national defense, the military, law enforcement, or is seen as an intelligence problem. And because of this perception, um, it is often thought that then cybersecurity is best delivered by professional within those communities, law enforcement, military, intelligence people. So what we argue in the report is that in order to mainstream cybersecurity and digital resilience into the development thinking broadly, we should reframe the cybersecurity narrative in terms of digital resilience, safety, trust, sustainability, risk management, rather than just talk about security. Again, to not perpetrate that perception. Next slide, please. So closely related to this perception issue is the fact that cybersecurity is not yet part of the official development assistance criteria established by the OECD. For those of you who are not, might not be familiar, this concept of official development assistance was adopted in 1969 to identify specifically development funding provided by government agencies to developing countries and to multilateral development institutions to support, um, again, economic growth, sustainable development. But this set of rules and criteria, again, adopted at the end of the 1960, um, is still the gold standard today. It's still the gold standard of how foreign governments provide assistance um, to developing countries and um, development organization. And it is still the main source of financing for development aid today. So these sets of rules called DACAbility from the Development um, Assistance Committee uh, and their criteria can often be a constraint for some of the donor countries that do want to fund cybersecurity projects, but are either not allowed to by their laws, their expectation, this OECD uh, criteria. And so those that want to fund cybersecurity project, we found that they have to find different pathway, different ways to fund those cybersecurity efforts as special items of their development agenda. So it could be like part of their digital transformation, part of reforming the legal system, or they have to end up funding them as completely outside the scope of those DACA criteria. 
So the, the Development Assistance Committee does update um, every three years the list of eligible countries to receive those official development assistance um, funding. But what they haven't yet updated are the criteria for eligible assistance to include cybersecurity and digital resilience. So what we recommend in the report is that the Development Assistance Committee at the OECD adds specifically digital resilience. So again, we're trying to move away from just cybersecurity, cybersecurity as a term. So we are recommending the OECD to add digital resilience to the criteria for eligible assistance as part of their peace and security activities, which are updated every so often. Um, in fact, in the last update in 2016, they actually included some, you know, very limited development related um, uh, training, for example, some funding can go to like military actors in limited areas or law enforcement activities. And so the peace and security component of those uh, DACA criteria could be expanded to add digital resilience and enable cybersecurity related assistance. So this is certainly one of our key recommendation and probably the most ambitious one. Um, and we're hoping that there will be champions among the donor countries and some of the organization that we, we uh, worked with to really um, convince the OECD to take this on and consider adding digital resilience to those criteria. Next slide, please. Um, another of the issues that we identified is that even when some of those donor countries and donor organizations are able to fund the cybersecurity initiatives or digital development projects that have a cybersecurity component, most donors, implementers, and even the recipient countries still see technology, information communication technology, as a long-term capital asset, as a one-time only expense rather than commodities. Again, this piece of technology, the hardware, the software that we're providing as part of those digital development project, um, they need to be updated and replaced every five to 10 years. It's not something you buy one and you use it for the rest of the lifetime of your cert or, or um, other your SOC or other entities. And if we don't update them and replace them, this actually ends up making the program unsustainable and even insecure because that technology will no longer be used safely. And many developing countries, again, cannot even afford sometimes the long term cost uh, to sustain those institutions, uh, national cybersecurity agency, national certs and the workforce that is funded using development loans and donors money. So we really need to start thinking. Next slide, please about the entire life cycle of a project. And so any digital development project, any cyber capacity building project that includes hardware and software needs to include the total cost of ownership from ICT support, purchasing, updating, reviewing it to uh, new, providing new system upgrades. And we need to include those costs in the project formulation. It has to be programmed into the assistance packages from the beginning. And the recipient country, as I was saying earlier, must also embed the ICT commodity refresh, the ICT support, the upgrades, the workforce training, retention into their own national budget. If we want this project to be sustainable and secure in the long run. Next slide, please. So to the you know, good news and, and best aspect that I really enjoyed listing um, in the report, uh, we highlight many of the benefits of incorporating cybersecurity, digital resilience, cyber capacity building into the broader development agenda, um, and the importance of promoting greater coordination and collaboration between the development community and the cyber capacity building community. We also feature some really interesting and noteworthy efforts to develop digital public goods. Um, the UN uh, report uh, on uh, the roadmap for digital cooperation talks about uh, digital public goods. We also identified many of these um, digital public goods. We see them as universal tools and instruments. They can be shared and applied globally, adapted to specific circumstances, but mostly they're free and available. Um, so as I was saying, even the UN roadmap for digital cooperation has been pushing 
working to create digital public goods as a way to help support and accelerate the sustainable development goals and as a way to improve digital cooperation. The Secretary General just reiterated this concept again in September in his new report, Our Common Agenda, where we're reiterating the, the positive dividends of using technology um, to support the sustainable development goals, but also to make them broadly available to the community. We highlight many of these public uh, public goods in the report. In particular, I'll just mention a few. Um, we were really impressed with the Crest Cybersecurity Maturity Model assessments, which provide a freely accessible, affordable, and sustainable assessment tool to measure the maturity and the financial inclusion of the cyber ecosystem of a country. So that can help um, better assess and compare country sector organization, um, identify good practices or gaps that need to be addressed. Another of the tools that we highlight in the report is the civil portal. Um, the, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise launched four years, uh, two years ago. They just had their second birthday, the civil portal. Um, and it actually captures many of these uh, digital public goods that are covered in the report. And it's really the largest database that exists today of cyber capacity building projects, methodologies, frameworks, tools, resources. Um, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise is also trying to serve as a clearinghouse to better direct the various requests for support uh, for capacity building activities and connect the requesting countries with donors and implementers. Um, another of the tools we highlight is the recently released um, Cybersecurity Primer the USAID published that shows why and how to incorporate cybersecurity and digital resilience safeguard throughout an entire program life cycle. But again, what all of these tools and efforts have in common is that they can serve multiple communities, they can be adapted and shared and applied globally, and can sort of help you know, bridge the development community with the cyber capacity building thinking and allow for funding to be more focused towards the real needs of those developing countries on a demand driven basis rather than a supply driven basis. Next slide, please. The report also highlights the need to cultivate local um, uh, indigenous capacity and develop a local cybersecurity workforce. Um, obviously, doing that requires addressing some of the related challenges, which we do recognize and highlight in the report. Some of those challenges are the affordability of cyber certification. And again, we go back to the digital public goods. For example, Crest has been doing a lot of work to provide professional level certification, accreditation, career pathways for individuals. We, there is also a need to develop um, you know, better tailored cybersecurity curricula in different schools and university. And here, for example, we interviewed a Japan international cooperation agencies that is working in partnership with the local universities in some of the countries where they have development project to um, develop this more tailored curriculum and they, they see university as a nat neutral nat natural place to develop indigenous capacity. Uh, we also need to identify well, local talents that we already have in many of these countries. And here I would highlight the digital, uh, the Diplo Foundation efforts to actually train and educate and tailor capacity building programs specifically for diplomats, diplomatic personnel and policy makers. Um, and then obviously there is the problem of retaining people who have been trained um, to some of these development projects or cyber capacity building um, activities, but then decide to leave government position to pursue jobs in the private sector or even leave the country, this brain drain. And so more funding, more tailored project, more um, effort to develop the, the capacity locally and retain that talent is also really important. Next slide, please. Another thing that is super important is that in order to design more tailored programs and develop that indigenous capacity and generate that local buy-in needed, first and foremost, we need to better understand the local ecosystem, the context we're working with, and the specific cyber risk, cyber threats to that society in that country. And we can do that if we don't have local data, trends, statistics, and field research. 
So having more and better local data and statistics requires obviously engaging local stakeholders, researchers, students, civil society, so that they can cooperate on data gathering, on how to better use that data. And this in turn can help develop better digital development project that again are based on the needs of the recipient countries and can help make a better more compelling argument to national leaders as to why cybersecurity is important to the country and again ideally this will help generate local buy-in by reframing a lot of these activities in terms of economic development digital resilience safety trust sustainability risk management, which really speaks to our national leaders and political um, the decision makers more than just talking about cybersecurity as again, a national security problems and intelligence problem. We need to better align the economic and the security needs of the country. Um, and so some of our uh, recommendation to uh, for, for this is to allocate fundings to local universities, students, researchers, so that they can gather local evidence. They can conduct trend analysis in that country or that region. And they can help better characterize the threat within that country or that region. And, and let's not forget that we should include the local private sector and civil society who are definitely crucial partner in building digital and cybersecurity ecosystem and also have better access to local data and have a certainly a better interest in economic and societal growth. Next slide and now, then I'll pass it to Melissa. Um, in addition to funding local research and engaging the private sector, uh, we should definitely think more about using the local development organization and civil society who might have not thought through all the unintended consequences and potential misuse of information and communication technology yet or uh, they're not part of their project, but they have a better understanding for sure of the local challenges. They, they have better local connection in the community. They have valuable relationships with the local implementers. And so they can help raise uh, both cybersecurity awareness within the community. They can help build capacity in those countries where they operate. And this might also be a great opportunity for practical collaboration between the development community, which again brings on that on the ground expertise and those local networks with the cyber capacity building community that can come and provide extensive you know, expertise and knowledge, uh, but might not have any presence or, uh, on the ground or understanding of the local context. Um, so with that positive recommendation, I'll pass on to Melissa to finish on um, the presentation. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you so much for all your reports and um, additional thoughts that come to the state Thank you, Francesca. That was really great and I uh, apologize for my technical difficulties here in uh, outside the national capital of the United States. Uh, the, if you could advance to the next slide um, and just building on all of the points that Francesca has made over the last uh, uh, 30 minutes or so, she identified that we, we through the report had identified that there's a fair amount of duplication of effort, that there are what has been termed the darling countries where everybody all of the multilateral development banks and many of the bilateral development institutions are sending money to key countries and that there are some countries that are um, are not receiving the funds and so we really need to be thinking about this more broadly. We also saw that um, as, as Francesca said that there are um, is an it's an export strategy that the developed world is exporting their talent, their companies, um, and their knowledge, and we're not necessarily building that indigenous capacity, um, which is why it's so important that we think about um, the solutions that will scale for the region, um, the mentor-protege relationships that we can have from whether uh, we saw one really great example highlighted in the report where um, the development institutions worked with Kenya and then Kenya started to become working within the region and provided regional capacity, and that's what we need to see much more of of uh, approaches and solutions that scale and building the indigenous capacity. Next slide. Uh, just as Nupi is doing um, here, this uh, allowing us to present the report this morning, um, and we've had the Organization of American States help uh, uh, position the report. Of course, the Global Forum on Cyber Expert Experts Expertise and the Foundation. Um, we really need to network the networks. It's not a natural fit of the cybersecurity community or the cyber capacity building 
of all of those um, uh, experts working with the development community. As Francesca said, the development community is just beginning to realize that their digital development has to be de-risked uh, and the misuse of ICTs is increasing at a scope and scale that we cannot afford to um, continuing to make our society more vulnerable. So we have to explore the venues where we can naturally bring these uh, institutions and these experts together uh, so that we can build again and achieve more resilient outcomes for digital development. Digital development must be resilient, safe, trusted development. Next slide. So through the course of our um, discussions with and interviews and writing this, uh, this uh, document, we identified and participated in some, whether it was the Asia Infrastructure Bank, uh, the World Bank um, annual meeting, this got highlighted, uh, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, uh, their annual meeting just a few weeks ago. This was also highlighted at the Internet Governance Forum over in Poland last week, the Democracy Summit last week. Uh, and we identified some future uh, uh, facing uh, networking and bridging venues that we think should be there. Again, we welcome your input on um, other venues that are gonna be coming up in 2022. Uh, we have to develop a roadmap on here are the areas that we think we can start to bring these communities together. And, um, and we're really, uh, you know, really excited to be able to actually help drive change because there's so much money, as Francesca said, $170 billion a year are going into digital development and very few of those projects are de-risked. And so it's our responsibility to build resilient, safe, trusted digital development. And that can only happen if we start to bridge the cybersecurity community with the digital development and the broader development agenda. Last slide. So we encourage you to follow us on uh, Either the GFCE is promoting this, uh, the World Bank through digital development, um, us, Francesca and I at the Cyber Readiness Index, Cyber Ready Index. We've given you a link here to the report again. We encourage you to download it. If you only have 10 minutes, just read the executive summary. If you have a couple of hours, read the whole thing, including the annex. You will likely learn something about the digital development and the cybersecurity community. We welcome your questions. Niels, thank you so much for hosting us this afternoon. And uh, we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca and uh, Melissa. That was really a great presentation and very useful presentation, I think. So um, everybody, I really want to encourage um, the same thing as uh, Francesca and Melissa has encouraged. Read their uh, report. There's a lot of useful stuff in, in it and they have really done a, a great job in swiping the, the field and uh, collecting data and uh, information through interviews and, and uh, uh, other uh, kind of methods. So um, I think we have a lot of uh, questions already for you. Uh, so I'll just uh, start uh, uh, reading them. Um, uh, there's uh, the first one. Uh, you probably can see the chat as well, but I'll read the questions. Uh, Niels, maybe if you stop sharing the screen and we all see each other and join in, because I, I can't see Fine. the chat, but I'll, I'll just listen if you read the question, please. Okay, so do you still see the, the PowerPoint or this? Yeah, I do. All right, okay. Yeah, I'll read the question. So the first one goes, Thanks for some great points on bridging the development community and the cybersecurity capacity building. What do you suggest the GFCE can do specifically to cooperate with implementers in the development community in order to ensure the cybersecurity or de-risking or digital uh, solutions? I think that I'll just start. I think that the the GFCE community is is really comprised of many of the cybersecurity experts. And I think that the GFC community, as they operate in different countries, that they should be seeking um, to find out who in the World Bank is working in the region, where is digital development happening, working with the UN uh, representatives and starting to create those bridges. But I think that it's going to have to be an active participation with the country um, leaders as well as the development banks that are and or multilateral institutions or even the private foundations that are operating in these countries. They're going to have to be 
actively um, trying to engage those in order to bridge that conversation. And I'd, uh, right now, that's not is that's not happening yet. And I think that would be something that I would recommend to the GFCE community. Francesca. Uh, yes, thank you. We, they actually, uh, during their annual meetings, specifically ask that question. So thank you to your viewers because they want to see what is their role in all of this. And so first and foremost, so what they're trying to do, and I think that that's um, rightly placed, they're trying to elevate the importance of cyber capacity building on the broader international agenda. They're trying to bridge those communities and have this conversation um, internationally more. I think that they can make a real impact in building also that coalition of donor countries to um, address uh, the need for the OECD to um, update those criteria because in order to um, allow the implementers that your um, a viewer asked to even better de risk their project and include cybersecurity, we first need to allow development programs to include cybersecurity or digital resilience as a component of those development projects because then if it's built into the project, the implementers will need to hire the expert and understand and learn how to develop those projects with the cybersecurity and digital resilience component built in from the beginning, the outset of the project. Um, so again, updating those set of rules and criteria will start changing that conversation and make them awfully part of every development uh, project, which all have a digital component. And so the GFC uh, has a role to play in raising that awareness, again, building that quality hopefully that they can convince the OECD Development Assistance Committee uh, to update those criteria. And then obviously, again, I think that um, a GFCE doesn't necessarily work directly with the implementers. They want to be um, a clearinghouse to better connect the recipient countries with, to the potential um, uh, you know, implementers and others. They don't let go into the country and work directly with the implementers. So they also want to stay in their lane as they try to facilitate those connections. I can't hear you, Neil. Sorry about that. <laughs> Unmute. Um, thank you very much for uh, good uh, responses to the the question. We have another one from Mr. Ole Villers. Um, uh, who has just uh, actually, I know, finished his uh, PhD on uh, cybersecurity and international relations, also worth reading. Uh, so he's asking, could you maybe provide a donor country perspective on how best to pursue such an integrated approach for uh, cybersecurity capacity building? How can donor countries best integrate development, security and foreign policy teams to deliver on comprehensive cyber capacity building. Are you aware of best practices, some concrete best practices or, or some different approaches? Well, I, I, um, it's a great question. Um, so each country bilaterally approaches digital development or cybersecurity differently. Um, and there are different rules based on our laws and whether or not we're following the OECD uh, development assistance criteria. And so, so it starts with that um, at broadly. Uh, so um, many of the, um, some of the best practices that we saw were countries that are actively um, giving aid to um, a recipient and um, really working to ensure that the government of the recipient country is thinking about the aid for really a short-term but a long-term sustainable outcome. Meaning, as Francesca said earlier, they have to put it into their national budget in order to replace software or hardware or actually buy the hardware and software for the program. There are some countries like the United Kingdom and a few others that we interviewed that equipment or software and hardware cannot be part of the financing. So you have to work with the recipient country to that they are buying the, the, the technologies that's necessary in order to, for the project. Uh, we also saw um, some really unique workarounds on um, uh, for Ukraine and other countries on how do we get to um, safe and, and trusted uh, digital development that's not necessarily cybersecurity because we can't use that word because of the OECD DAC ability. And um, 
And so we saw some unique things there. Uh, I, and I'm sure Francesca has more that she can add to the to your question. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, that is not a perfect example. Um, they're having those conversation, but of all the, the, the national development agencies we talk to, um, or mostly Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which are really championing the some uh, uh, the, the addition of cybersecurity and development project. What we found is that they either find different pathways to fund those uh, cybersecurity efforts, so there's special items of development so they can fit within that DAC ability. So they call it dig helping digital transformation, like the risk in digital transformation, securing that digital transformation of the developing countries or as developing and reforming their legal uh, framework. So even if they can't fund um, the technology piece, the ICT, they are trying to help uh, the country develop capacity and reform their system. And as part of that, they include cybersecurity. Or in some cases, they're funding them as completely outside the scope of the data criteria where countries like Israel, the United States, find that there is a real need in that country, not just to make that country more secure and resilient, but because like you Neil say in your report, is because they're realizing that from those countries, then they could be harboring cyber criminals because they don't have the legal framework to um, investigate, prosecute, or um, send them to another countries, or because they are, um, you know, harboring the botnets or the technology. So there are countries that are just going outside that uh, criteria to fund cybersecurity efforts because they see the need, not just in the recipient countries, but also because as a developed world, we are now on the receiving end of the threats and the criminals that are now harbored in those countries. So they, they do it anyway, but they can use the development funding. Um, so certainly it would be ideal if the two um, could be brought together under the big, larger development agenda. Yeah, so we're all in the same boat, so to speak, and uh, so they're talking about the weakest link uh, theory there, and it's uh, important to build capacity and resilience uh, all over the world as the world is being digitalized. So. Very good uh, comments on those uh, questions. Uh, another question uh, from uh, Lars uh, Jesvik. Um, he would like to address point six in your report on building uh, skilled local labor forces. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on how we could uh, do that while avoiding brain drain due to the global labor shortage on cybersecurity professionals? You were touching a little bit on that in, in your talks, but uh, if you could uh, elaborate on that, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a part of the, um, the issues that were raised by many. So we talked to recipient countries as well. And this is this came uh, up on every single of those conversation that even if they do have local expert and they want, by the way, they want that recognition so that we don't continue to just perpetrate these supply um, driven model where we have to bring our expert. There is a local cybersecurity workforce growing in, in a lot of this country, but we need to cultivate it. We need to support it. And one of the problem is that even when there is funding for a local capacity building, uh, often some of the people that have been trained then leave government position for the private sector, which pays more, or they leave the country altogether. Again, that's why we go back to some of those digital public goods where some of the organization are trying to develop curricula, specific uh, program, first of all, uh, so that we can um, uh, increase the awareness of all the different careers in cybersecurity um, and all the different jobs that they, they, they could have within the government, within the local community, so that they don't have to feel the need to leave the country. Uh, but the, certainly all of these efforts are still in their incipient stages and they need to be further strengthened. It certainly needs more funding. Funding. We need to make cyber certification more affordable. Um, we need to um, identify maybe some of the other people in the community that might not be technical expert, but they can still provide um, really important contribution to policy development, for example. Um, to actual development project on the ground. So I think understanding all those connections, understanding the cybersecurity as a field is so broad and includes more than the technical expert um, on top of the fundings and the certification and other efforts to retain people are really important. But the brain drain, uh, it's a problem in all of our country, developed countries as well as the developing ones. I guess I, what I would add to that is um, 
So what we observed is that some of the <clears throat> bilaterally are, are working specifically like Japan's International Cooperation Agency is working with Indonesia to develop um, university curricula. Uh, we saw the Diplo Foundation is working and has presents classes, um, uh, both technical and policy perspective um, in many countries to develop um, uh, really kind of skill set. There's uh, companies or countries um, that are working with Organization of American States really just as to sensitize diplomats on what is what are rules of, en of engagement and, and responsible state behavior so they can participate in the United Nations dialogues. And then there's um, CREST has a certification program where they're really working to get more technical skills into countries and, and affordable technical skills into countries. And as Francesca said, affordability is one of the challenges. Um, a second challenge, honestly, is that we're not thinking broadly enough about cybersecurity. We've binned it as a technical aspect and it's, it touches foreign policy. It touches development and, and, and aid. It touches the law and all the legal aspects of operating in a digital economy. It is the digital economy and it's trade. And so we, and it's, it's, you know, all of, as we're starting to go more into um, more aspects, more and more aspects of our life are digitized, it becomes part of every, every aspect of any kind of career field, whether it's you're a doctor or you're a teacher or you're a lawyer or you're a military officer or you're a diplomat, it really transcends all of those things. And then lastly, I, I, whether it's that we don't have the right skills, I think we don't have the right skills in any country because we're not thinking about it broad enough and we haven't brought some of these basic digital skills into our elementary schools, our primary and secondary schools. So we have to think about it like math or history or basic science that has to be mainstreamed back with our children. Um, in addition to upskilling our uh, our uh, us as we're in our careers or mid careers or end of careers, and then um, a, an unintended consequence of skills development that we observed or and learned during our report is that in some countries when we've actually upskilled the the workers that the, the, that they're not necessarily leaving to go for. Um, to go work from the government into a company that they're actually going into organized crime and so that they can actually make more money um, by turning their skill sets into crime fraud and the other things that were the abuse and misuse of ICTs. So that's an unintended consequence of us upskilling or skilling uh, uh, in, uh, the workforce that they might actually turn to do it for harm. Thank you very much. So, rolling out uh, digital technology all over the world will, of course, um, uh, also produce new kind of uh, vulnerabilities, and and that is where um, uh, the development agenda really can uh, do some work. And uh, you are covering a lot of good ground on how to do it. Uh, and I think that um, what you're talking about now is also that it has to be. Uh, this has to be contextualized to to every situation or to, to each country and to, to the local circumstances uh, and also to each um, sector. So uh, and, and what you're also talking about here, I think, is, is that um, uh, digital technology and uh, uh, cyber resilience really need to rest on analog foundations. So you really need to build, you need to do traditional development aid as well. You need to build institutions, uh, uh, universities, education, uh, rule of law system. You need to focus on these things in connection with um, with the digital technology and the trends that are, we, we see right now. And um, I think that Claudia has um, a question here that is um, um, fitting good with, with what we're talking about now, following up on. So, so this is because it's like you're saying it's huge it can be everywhere so we need to also focus and and uh, and you need to also get local ownership into in, into this and so when so she's asking when considering that many developing countries still suffer from poor basic infrastructure such as water supplies and, and roads 
how can we expect national and local authorities to prioritize costs related to the uphold of safe ICT solutions? Are oh, you muted? There we go. I'm definitely having technology challenges today. <laughs> um, it's a very good point, and we've heard that from many of the like Inter-American Development Bank, Organization of American States, many of the um, uh, multilateral development banks on if, if, if I had dollar for dollar, I'm going to build a school, I'm going to build a road, I'm going to build safe drinking water before I'm going to uh, invest in safety or trusted, safe, secure uh, ICT. Absolutely. But the challenge that we have is, is that as we're building out those new systems, right, the school is going to have computers in it and, and internet most likely. Uh, the water is going to be managed through industrial control systems. The transport is going to have some type of, of transport management, whether that's rail or road, et cetera. And all of those things are digital. And, um, and, uh, and so as we're spending the 170 billion a year or even more than that on building out these important institutions and, and utilities for these countries, we, we have to responsibly de-risk those investments by ensuring that we're building in the safety, security, resilience, and trust into the technologies as they're deployed. Um, and we have to actually start to show what happens when um, you don't think about it. Uh, and so um, in the United States, we had uh, the water supply in Florida. Um, uh, somebody uh, came in through an unprotected uh, uh, system through remote access, so over and through the internet, and changed the chemical levels of lye, which would have poisoned an entire town. Um, we saw uh, here, I'll use another example here in the United States, multiple examples. Uh, we had um, our oil and gas shut down for six days in the, on the eastern coast because of an unprotected uh, uh, router um, and coming in through a VPN with stolen credentials and we weren't using multi-factor authentication. We had the same thing with our food supply or, uh, for beef and pork was taken down because the manufacturing plants were all ransomed. Um, last week, we had one of our power grids taken down in Colorado, again, because we weren't protecting them. Those, that's all just the United States. Uh, you know, we had the national rail system in Iran taken down two week, you know, just a few weeks ago. You've had the, um, the entire energy grid of Johannesburg brought down through ransomware in South Africa. And so I can give you an example in any one of our countries where the misuse of ICT or the fact that we didn't invest in the safety, security, resilience of these technologies is now causing harm to society. And those are the things that we have to bring uh, forward when we're talking to a recipient country for our donor money of why they have to do it. Because I'm sorry, the water, you might think you're getting safe, safe drinking water, but if I can get access to it over the internet, I can poison it. At Niels, this goes to the heart of why we even did this report. Again, we are trying to bridge this community so that you don't have the development communities coming in, developing the infrastructure, and then separately and in silos, the cyber capacity building community coming in and just saying to the country, you need a national cybersecurity strategy, you need a CERT. We are arguing that you need to align the economic and security needs and that the digital resilience, the cybersecurity has to be a component of the development project and then only then you can start to hope that those infrastructure that are being built that are extremely vitally important for the country can be also secured um, trusted and safe not as a separate set of investments thank you very much um, so this uh, also shows that how how um fundamental this uh, this topic the digital technology and development it is but nevertheless it's always a, uh, uh, um, a case of a priority and, and where the really fundamental needs are very present it's it's difficult to to prioritize these kind of things but they are because they are more long term but they could 
still be fun fundamental. So, so it's a little bit uh, tricky, uh, and and you're really covering good ground with uh, with bridging the communities there in 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 the um, in the report. I have another uh, question here, uh, which is um, very concrete uh, question. Have you been in touch with the Global Alliance for Digital Public Goods? Norway is uh, co-lead since 2018. Uh, and several countries are working. And uh, it looks like you have been in touch with them. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a great on them. Download the reports. Yes, we absolutely highlight them as uh, part of the digital public goods that we identified. And um, so the reports uh, in two different sections has a whole you know, a whole chapter on digital public goods and why they're considered, you know, um, internationally available, shareable, adaptable uh, tools. And then in the annex, there is a more detailed discussion and description of some of these institutions and what they are providing um, globally. So yes, absolutely, that was one of the examples we highlighted. And uh, and it was brought to us um, through multiple entities, but specifically the Gates Foundation wanted us to um, to get in, in touch with the Global Alliance. So we did highlight, as Francesca said, as you, you'll see it in multiple places in the report, and that the, the importance of digital public goods are that they are in theory scalable and everybody can reuse them. So then we're being more efficient with our funding and um, we really need to produce probably more digital public goods and we need to start getting the broader development community to use them. And, um, and know about what each other are doing, because we are also seeing a lot of duplication of effort on duplicate um, on these digital public goods. Like one bank is doing one set of risk assessments, another bank is doing a different set of risk assessments, a new methodology on a new toolkit on how to secure critical information infrastructure. And we're basically highlighting, well, no, that already exists here. This already exists here. Could you please just go and use what already exists and then or create something that doesn't for you know, a gap in a sector. Yeah, thanks. Great. Um, I I want to uh, ask a, a question myself as well, uh, since we have time to that, and it is um, a little bit. It has to do with the um, uh, the lag between policy and reality. There's always uh, takes making policy takes time, and reality moves as reality moves on, and especially digital technology, which is moving really, really, really fast. So, um, uh, and uh, in addition, there is this question of uh, priority that we touched upon just recently uh, about uh, fundamental needs and uh, more long term needs. And uh, so, so if um, you you have, you write a lot about this in, in the report and you have talked about it, but if you if you could try to be a little bit more um, uh, specific if you if you were to give an advice to to uh, policymakers working in, in in a ministry of foreign affairs in a donor country um, where they have these um, uh, working structures that are perhaps not uh, haven't included uh, this uh, perspective uh, in the structure uh, yet or has done it but it is not uh, 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 a strong stru structure and you have a lot of other strong structures which are um, in a way uh, focused on the DAC uh, criteria and, and other kind of criteria. So, so if you were to, based on your um, uh, research and uh, swiping the field and, and uh, working in the international organizations and elsewhere, the, your experience, uh, if, you, if you were to give an advice to, to people working in, in Ministry of Foreign Affairs on how to make their uh, organization, their structure uh, work uh, better towards this topic, what, what would it uh, be? Um, I, I think there, there needs to be, um, I think maybe a sensitization of the diplomatic corps or the broader um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on um, on just I think just the just the, using case studies of here's how the here's what we're trying to achieve you know from a foreign policy perspective here's the technology that's underpinning it 
Um, and and here's again, here's the strengths and here are the weaknesses or here's, you know, here's how it will it will lead to, um, you know, more resilient outcomes or the things that we want for these countries. And here's how it could be misused. I think that there's a general lack of awareness among the majority of our government officials, all like I'll just cross the board, whether it's, you know, trade, commerce, finance, etc. There's very there's a very there's a general lack of awareness on the misuse of ICTs one. There's absolute general, I would say, lack of understanding that these ICTs are commodities and they have to be replaced every five to seven years, maybe 10. But even if you look at the bug that was uh, was patched on you know Friday morning or Thursday night, right? That that affects Cisco, Oracle, Apache, VMware, and every every government around the world is now scrambling to how do they patch these systems? That they need to understand that that is that's a vulnerability that will be exploited, and I don't think that they understand that ICTs are commodities and have to be replaced. And us in the developing world, we're not programming these this refresh into our um, into our budgets. So how can we expect really even the developing world to do it when we're not even when we're not thinking about it? And then third, and Francesca and I've written about this in a different venue, is is that um, you know we have uh, in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs we have those who are working on the digital economy. We have those that are working on um, rules of engagement or export controls or things along those lines from a military or national security perspective. And then we still have others that are working on on trade negotiations. And every single one of those have digital components. And one of our diplomats could be working on a security issue, export control, rules of engagement, state behavior. And another one could be working on digital trade and working on the free flow of goods, services, data, and capital across borders. And they could be negotiating against each other, but they're on your they're on the same side. And so we have again, we have to sensitize these officials across the board on all of these on um, all of the aspects of digital, um, so that they can be working more, um, uh, you know, holistically uh, for foreign policy perspectives. And Niels, just briefly to add to that, I will point to you and the readers to um, one of the digital public goods we highlight, which is the USAID recent cybersecurity primer. Again, the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other national development agency can read as a practical, it lists so many good reasons and so many things that you might think, oh, that obvious, obviously, but it makes the links on why and how to incorporate cybersecurity and digital resilience safeguards throughout the entire development project life cycle. Um, again, if the goal here is to mainstream cybersecurity and digital resilience into the development thinking, and you want practical example, that is a, a great place, is a great report, just publicly available on all those good reasons why um, and how we should incorporate that digital resilience, safety, trust into the project that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are pushing out. And, and you know, we, we talked about that pathways and other ways to go around the adaptability criteria. But that cybersecurity primer um, is an easily uh, readable and, and you know easy to understand uh, framework on how to think about those issues specifically dedicated to development implementers, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs dedicated to this type of project. And, um, and he also brings up good examples of how USAID is starting to think about um, in embedding cybersecurity in their development projects. You're muted again. Second time. <laughs> Melissa and Francesca, that was great. Thank you very much. I think it's time to 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 wrap up, uh, but I would really like to say that I very much appreciate that you had the time to to get up early in the morning, even uh, almost in the in the night, uh, I think, uh, to, to be here and, and um, tell us about your uh, findings in the very interesting report that I encourage everyone to, to uh, take a look at. It's if you can find it at the uh, uh, um, event link, but it's also uh, you, you can find that uh, at our, our, our website at uh, nupi.no and, and, and uh, also through the event link. Yeah. So uh, with that, I just would like to say thank you very much 
and uh, that uh, I hope you will have a nice day, rest of the day, and uh, good luck in continuing to do the, the work that you do, and uh, uh, to everyone listening as well, and you guys also, have a great uh, Christmas holiday, and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, and happy holidays. Be safe.